The Western Front was a series of trenches that stretched 700 kilometers from the Belgian coast to the Swiss Alps. By the time the Aussies arrived, two years into the war, the Germans and the Allies were locked in a stalemate. Neither was going anywhere. Thousands were dying over a few meters of land. Jonathan set out on a quest to find out why his countrymen today did not seem nearly as interested, let alone passionate, about the battles Australians fought after they left Gallipoli. Western Front, yeah. The Western Front died. Yeah, yeah. Because all veterans had now died, Jonathan put out a public appeal through newspapers and radio to contact any families and descendants who might have letters, diaries, or photographs to help him tell their story. Jonathan, it's good to see you. Thanks for having us. The descendants were so enthusiastic about this project that they sent me letters, diaries, postcards, photographs. I was inundated. Among the things that the descendants sent was a shoebox, a shoebox full of one soldier's letters. These are the original letters from the Western Front. I was also sent magazines, series of magazines written during World War I. The first and the worst battle the Australians fought on the Western Front was at Fromel. On the 19th of July, 1916, they attacked the Germans across flat no man's land, racing into machine gun fire. They didn't stand a chance. They suffered 5,533 casualties in the first 24 hours. This is hours. where the Australian men were, and they were to get across no man's land into the Germans were certainly situated at the back there. So this was completely flat, but it was terribly muddy and, and a lot of water. It's a very flat country uh, with no real uh, protection for the soldiers. The Germans were able, I think, to uh, sweep the battlefield and uh, to, to, uh, to kill the soldiers and uh, wave by wave. Since the start of the war, one of the most contested sites on the front was this city of Ypres, in the flat region of Belgium known as Flanders. The British had defended Ypres before, but now the Australians were called in to help at this third campaign to save Ypres from falling into German hands. It soon became a series of battles known as Third Ypres. If the Allies were going to hold Ypres, they would have to take out Messine Ridge. Following the Allied victory at Messine Ridge, Commander-in-Chief Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig was determined to push the enemy line as far back from Ypres as possible, capturing along the way the German-held villages of Broodsind, Pearlcapel and Passchendaele. But first, they had to fight through the Polygon Wood. At first light on the 26th, the Allied gunners hit the Germans with artillery and the Allied soldiers charged 1,500 metres into the woods. They suffered 5,000 casualties, but won two of the total 52 Victoria Crosses, won by Australians at the Western Front. One of them awarded posthumously to Patrick Bugden. He uh, came to France at the uh, end. This fabulous monument of a digger is a tribute to the men of the 2nd Division who captured Mont Saint Quentin here late August 1918 before going into Peron, which they also captured in early September. Monash said they could do it. Rawlinson from the British Army said they couldn't. But as Jonathan King and the descendants have shown us, finally, the Western Front is emerging from behind the shadow of Gallipoli and there can be no going back. It has become part of Australian history. Let this be a timely tribute to the 46,000 Australians who died and to the quarter of a million who played such a big part in winning World War One. The Australian dead are probably better remembered in Belgium and in France than they are in Australia. 
We've reached that moment in our history when uh, everything is passing from memory into history. And when you get to that point in relation to great events, there's always a, a determination to hang on to them. I want to honour their memory uh, and I want to be able to uh, show my children and future generations.